This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. The novelist Paulo Coelho, I'm not sure if you know that name, wrote The Alchemist and The Pilgrimage, a wonderful uh, novelist, writes this. None of us knows what might happen even the next minute. Yet we still go forward because we trust, because we have faith. Well, faith is at the very center of our gospel passage from Mark. Mark, the first gospel. Mark, the shortest gospel. Mark, who writes with an action-packed style that takes us immediately from one thing to the next. Mark's gospel uses the word immediately 41 times, pushing the action forward. You can easily read Mark in one sitting, and I urge you to do that sometime, because you can then get sort of the full flavor of the urgency and the drive of Jesus' ministry. And so in today's passage, Mark also uses a literary technique. It's called intercalation. But what that really means is a story within a story. Mark sandwiches Uh, the story of the hemorrhaging woman in between the two parts of Jairus' dying daughter. And in doing so, he highlights their similarities and differences, but he ends up saying something very profound about faith. So come with me. Act 1. Jesus crosses the Sea of Galilee again. And as he gets off the boat, there's this huge huge crowd waiting for him by the sea, and suddenly he's approached by Jairus, one of the leaders of the synagogue, who suddenly falls at Jesus' feet to beg him to come and lay hands on and save his dying daughter. Well, he must have come running, and with family and friends running after him. Now, Jairus is a man with much He's a man of means, position, authority, and very prominent in the synagogue, who obviously, though, ignores what all the other synagogue leaders might be saying about Jesus because he runs to where his heart tells him God's healing power is. His faith, deep within him, given to him by God, propels him forward and it overrides doctrine, decorum, and status. He falls at Jesus' feet. Well, Jesus goes with him immediately, and the crowd follows. End of Act 1. Now, Act 2, on the road to Jairus' home, the crowd presses in on Jesus as they walk. And a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years who is ritually unclean, an outcast, alone, suffering, and extremely poor, having spent all she had on one doctor after another who could not help her. She makes her way through the crowd, headscarf pulled tight, trying not to be seen, determined to touch just the hem of his cloak, She is driven by faith, deep within her, given to her by God. Faith that the healing power of God somehow lives in this holy man, and this is her only hope, and that all she has to do is just get close enough to touch his clothing, and she will be healed. She makes it. She touches the hem, and immediately the bleeding stops. And immediately Jesus feels the power go out of him, and he stops. He stops. He turns, looks out at the crowd, and asks his disciples who touched him. Now why does he do that? Jairus is probably saying, please don't stop, we have to hurry. And the disciples are incredulous. Everyone is pushing and shoving to get close. How can we possibly know who touched you? Lots of people touched you. 
Well, Jesus ignores them all, stays put, looks at the people, and then the poor, outcast, insignificant female comes forward, falls at his feet, and tells him the whole truth. Jesus calls her daughter. He places her in relationship with him. He says, your faith has healed you. In essence, she is as responsible for the healing as he is. They did it together. Jesus seeks her out. Jesus honors this relationship. The healing was already done. He could just let whoever it was slink away. But as one commentator I read says, Jesus reaches back through the shame of poverty and the purity laws and pulls her to him to be in relationship with him. Now Jairus, a leader in the synagogue, the man with much, also desperate, had to wait. They are equal to Jesus in their suffering and need, but Jesus attends to the poor woman first. For Jesus, the poor, those without, are always first in God's kingdom, not ours. End of Act 2. Now, Act 3 begins when Jesus overhears new arrivals telling Jairus that his daughter is dead and not to trouble the teacher any further. To me, this sounds a little bit like a dig. Jairus, stop messing with this fanatic and come home. Jesus, however, turns to Jairus, ignoring the skeptics, and says, Do not fear, only believe. Jesus knows how easily we can be dissuaded by critics, even by family and friends who don't get it. Jesus does not rebuke the messengers or make a pronouncement to the crowd. Instead, he turns to Jairus in a quiet, private moment, looking at him, perhaps taking him by the shoulders and saying, don't be afraid. Trust me. And then Jesus takes charge. He makes everybody stay back. He takes only Peter, James, John, Jairus, and the family to the house. And they arrive at the big house with lots of people weeping and wailing loudly. And Jesus asks, why do you cry when the child is not dead but only asleep? Again, why does he do that? Why does he make this public claim why doesn't he just go inside with Jairus and his wife? Why does he set himself up for ridicule? And we are told they laughed at him. Well, perhaps it's because these episodes are about faith, and faith is not easy. The biggest obstacle to faith is not really intellectual, although we often claim that it is. The biggest obstacle to faith is peer pressure, the fear of ridicule or censure, often from family and friends, and particularly from those with education, status, means, and influence. Jesus takes that ridicule upon himself. Jairus was the leader of the synagogue, and his faith is now in a relationship with Jesus. Jesus knows what's at stake for Jairus and says, trust me. Jesus takes the ridicule on himself and away from Jairus as he clears the house of scoffers. He stands with Jairus and strengthens his faith. He takes Jairus, the wife, and a select few to where the child is. Jesus takes the girl by the hand and speaks to her in Aramaic, Get up, little girl. The color comes back into her body, her eyes open, she smiles as she walks, and you can imagine that those parents just grab her 
and cry and hold her tight. Then Jesus, ever mindful of our bodies, says, give her something to eat. And in a few minutes, Jesus will say to us, take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus is forever in relationship with faith. End of Act 3, the end. Faith is not easy. It wasn't then, it isn't now. Faith is not a signed document. It is a living relationship with Jesus, a relationship of trust. And Jesus knows that we can be weakened in our faith by ridicule, cynicism, gossip, censure, or exclusion. Jesus knows this, and so he stood with Jairus and took the ridicule upon himself. Jesus shows us the way we strengthen faith, the way we keep from slipping into the cynicism of the world. It is through our relationship with Jesus and with one another. Faith is not a system of beliefs. It is a relationship that lives and breathes and moves and deepens. And for faith to stay strong, we need each other. Now, I know that the pandemic combined with this transition time has been tough on many of you. And some of you have shared with me that you feel disconnected, that you fear the church is dwindling, that nothing seems to be happening, and that you're adrift even from your faith. And some of you have asked me, how do I strengthen my faith? We strengthen our faith by standing together as Jesus stood with Jairus. Now, I have a farewell gift for you, and I'm going to ask um, Christina and Robin to help me here to demonstrate how we are standing together in faith. So, um, okay, so in those shoes, Christina, you're going to have to walk backwards. Okay. Okay. And um, Robin's going to stand here, and you're going to walk all the way to the door. Okay. Okay. I admit this is a cheerleading effort, Uh uh-oh, and I hope it's an encouragement, a reminder of how strong you are. It is not, I repeat, an instrument of guilt, but rather a banner to strengthen you against pessimism, to strengthen your trust in God and one another. These are the ministries of your church and the people who do them, organized to support the mission statement that you wrote. These are people who stand together with you. And in these ministries, some may have forgotten that. So this is my crude attempt. And I'm sure I've left people out, or I've misspelled, or I've gotten it wrong. But I wanted you to see, in a kind of visual way, there's more. (laughs) maybe not of of all the things um, I lied, it's fine uh, that are being done here and all the people standing together in their faith whether it feels like it or not and I hope at some point we'll pull it out later at the coffee hour or put it in the parish hall that you'll write all over it or correct it or add to it but perhaps be inspired to take stock of where and how you want to stand together going forward. And I know there are a lot of repeats of people. And if your name isn't plastered on there, this is not to guilt you out. Your prayers that you offer strengthen our own faith as well as your own. And it is an essential part of our standing together. So let's leave this here, actually, all the way through to the end. You can walk on it. It's just paper. And so you can walk on these ministries uh, as you come to communion. 
as a reminder of all that you are. Faith is alive here at St. Francis. Jesus is here applauding. St. Francis is here singing and dancing. And standing together in your faith strengthens you. None of us knows what might happen even in the next minute. Yet we go forward because we trust, because we have faith. Be strong. I love you. You have glory days ahead.